Today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Welcome to the Census Academy Back to Data Basics webinar series. If you are looking to improve your data skills, the webinars are a great opportunity to learn from our experts about how to access and utilize a variety of Census Bureau data products, tools, and resources. My name is Anthony Ermitaggio, and I will be the host for today's event. Along with my colleagues, Lacey Lofton, and Alexander Barker, we will be providing technical support to our presenters and monitoring the Q&A to provide as much helpful information and resources as we can. Before we get started, I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. For those of you who are familiar, excuse me, are not familiar with WebEx, the chat Q&A feature can be accessed through the icons located in the bottom center of your event window and towards the right side of your WebEx event screen. Please feel free to submit your questions to the panelists using the Q&A panel. Uh, we ask that you direct the questions in the Q&A panel by choosing all panelists so we can promptly respond either in Q&A or we may read the questions verbally to the presenter uh, at the appropriate time. If there are no questions during the Q&A portion, we can address some of these questions then. The webinar is being recorded. The recording and supplemental materials will be uploaded within 30 business days prior to our Census Academy site for your reference. We also like to ask that you complete an evaluation at the end of the webinar today. We will put the evaluation link in chat towards the end of this session. Now I would like to introduce Alexander Barker, Census Academy Manager with the U.S. Census Bureau. Alexander, you may begin. Thank you, Anthony. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Census Academy Back to Data Basics webinar series. Um, I'm Alexander Barker. I'm the founder manager of Census Academy. I'm really excited that we are offering this series to all of you. Kim Brown, your presenter for today's class, is the mind behind this series. And in just a little bit, you'll learn more about her. This webinar series with 25 webinars is designed to take you on a learning journey from basic to more advanced knowledge and skills about accessing and using data from the Census Bureau. We are kicking off this series with a Census 101 class. This class will cover basic information about the Census Bureau programs, products, and services, and it will give you important background information that will prove useful as you continue to attend our classes. So before we jump into Kim's presentation, I want to thank, to thank Kim Brown, Lacey Lofton, and Lucas Fio for managing the series. And I want to give a special thank you to the Census Bureau webinar facilitation team for always doing an amazing job getting us ready and through conducting training to large audiences. So without further ado, um, here's your presenter, someone who taught me a lot when I first started working with census data, Kimberly Brown. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Alexandra. Good afternoon, everyone. As Alexandra said, my name is Kim Brown. I am presenting the Census 101 today. If you are not familiar with the Census Bureau or the data that we offer, this is an introduction presentation of the whole series. And what I mean by that is we're going to cover a lot of different things within this presentation that will be covered in the 25 webinars that are a part of this series. So we're, I'm doing the broad overview as an intro for everyone in hopes of piquing your interest in joining us for a later webinar on the topic that you need more information on. So next, a little bit about me. I've been a training specialist for about 14, 15 years now. I've been with the Bureau a very long time, but spent most of my time working with the data users, training them in accessing and understanding Census Bureau's data, products, and services. So what we're going to cover in this presentation is a little bit about us. We'll talk about a couple of the Census Bureau's programs, surveys, and geography. We'll introduce a couple of our data tools, talk a little bit about our products, 
and also talk to you a little bit about the partnerships that we have developed over time. So the first thing I want to introduce you to is our census.gov site. And as I mentioned, we're going to talk a little bit about us. And that is an actual tab on our home page. Some of the other items that we'll be talking about throughout this presentation are also under these tabs that you're seeing on this page, such as surveys and programs. Our tools would be under explore data. So you'll see a little bit of everything in this particular presentation. So the Census Bureau website offers users access to information by topic or program interactive maps, training resources, and data access tools. To begin to familiarize yourself with the census.gov site, the Census Bureau has made the search and navigation a bit easier for us all. We have our topics and surveys programs available from the top navigation. The explore the data, as I indicated, can be found, the tools can be found under that particular list. For, and also accessing certain data topics along the browse by topic. When looking for information on the agency, however, our history and other agency locations look to the About Us tab. Here you will find our frequently asked questions and our staff directory. And as mentioned, more information will be covered throughout the presentation relating to the tabs we're seeing on this particular page. So I'm going to begin with the Census mission. The Census Bureau's mission is to serve as the nation's leading provider of quality data about its people and economy. Our goal is to provide the best mix of timeliness, relevancy, quality, and cost for the data we collect and the services that we provide. Much of the data collected by our agency is required by law. Those that work here at the agency and are a part of the data collection are held accountable knowing that they can go to jail, pay a hefty fine, or be terminated from their job should they disclose any confidential information. A little bit about the organization. We have 13 major statistical agencies, so we're not just the main, we are the main statistical agency for dissemination and collection, but there are other statistical agencies a part of our process as well. There are 70 organizations that collect statistics. We are under the U.S. Department of Commerce. We have about nine directorates with about 44 division and offices. The Census Bureau also assists many government agencies in their collection of data. We refer to this data collection as reimbursable surveys. So even though we are the largest data collector and disseminator of social and economic data, we do work with other government organizations to assist them with their data needs as well. For those of you that may not be familiar, the Census Bureau's headquarters is located in Suitland, Maryland. We have a Washington, D.C. Um, address, and we also have a contact center or a call center that is located at headquarters to help folks with their data needs. We also have a computer center in Bowie. We also have two contact centers. One's in Jeffersonville, Indiana. The other is in Tucson, Arizona. We also have an international trade office in Puerto Rico. A national processing center is also in Jeffersonville, Indiana. And we have six regional offices. As you see here, there are Atlanta, Denver, Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, and Philadelphia. <clears throat> the Census Bureau has regional offices located across the United States. Each region covers multiple states. As discussed, we have two contact centers to assist with telephone surveys and any questions our customers have in completing the survey they have received. 
Spirit Headquarters, as mentioned, we have a customer call center that we help people to access the data that they require. Many of our surveys and censuses will have a return address for our Jeffersonville, Indiana location. This is the National Processing Center that handles the distribution return of our survey and program mailings. I know from years of working in the call center that many will call to inquire about the return address on our mailings, knowing that the Census Bureau is located in Maryland or the District of Columbia. MPC is a huge warehouse processing center that is better equipped to handle these large mailings. MPC is also one of the contact centers, as I mentioned, that you can call and inquire about a survey or also a uh, field representative. That's not to say you couldn't also reach out to the regional offices to verify a field representative's identification if they're at your door doing a follow-up to one of our surveys. So here's a breakout in the map for the regional offices. You'll see on the far right, <clears throat> upper left, or I should say upper right, what's covered in yellow is our New York regional office. What you see in green is our Philadelphia regional office. What's covered in purple is the Atlanta regional office. You'll see the orange is covered for Chicago and Denver is all in blue and the Los Angeles Regional Office also covers the West Coast in that tan color. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the censuses that are done by the Census Bureau. We have three censuses that we do. The decennial census, which most people are familiar with, that's the one that's done in years ending in zero. It's usually done for the 50 states, District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and island areas. And as indicated, years ending in zero, meaning it's done every 10 years. The significance or the purpose behind this is used for congressional redistricting, apportionment, and influences the distribution of $675 billion in federal funds annually. A lot of people may not be aware that we do a census for the account economic census. It measures the health of the nation's economy by providing vital statistics about industries and businesses. Again, we cover the District of Columbia, the 50 states, Puerto Rico, and the island areas. However, this particular census is done in years ending in two and seven, meaning every five years. This helps to influence policy decisions, create key measures for the economic well-being and used to gauge organizational structures and product trends. It's kind of what I refer to as the pulse of America's economy. Census of governments, this one a lot of people may not be familiar with at all. This is done also in years ending in two and seven, every five years. It's done for the 50 states and the District of Columbia. And it also measures the economic and financial performance, public policy, and also develops programs and budgets. The 2020 decennial census was our online questionnaire was available for the first time and could be responded to by just about any handheld device. We had mail in questionnaires for areas that might have had difficulty with Wi-Fi or folks that were more comfortable completing the questionnaire in writing and submitting it. We also have 10 questions that are a part of this particular census relating to age, sex, race, ethnicity, and rent to own. It only took about 10 minutes to complete this particular questionnaire. In years past, we have had um, a short and a long form. So it's really nice that we have the short form now. Decennial census data in action. And 
what this primarily is, is what we've talked a little bit about already is the apportionment, redistricting, funding of federal, state, and local government programs, program planning, site location, and marketing decisions. A census was written into our Constitution as a means of apportioning the number of representatives each state has in the House of Representatives. And within the state, census data provides the basis by which state and local governments redraw the boundaries of local, state, and congressional election districts. The census data are used by federal, state, and local governments to distribute billions of dollars each year to the nation's local governments for a wide variety of public programs and purposes. The census data is also vital in planning community facilities and services, roads, schools, and hospitals. And just so that you're aware, in case you're not, these also play a big role in emergency management operations. After Katrina, the Census Bureau was asked for a lot of data to help them figure out the housing structures that they had, the number of the population, and how to go about um, going in those areas that were devastated by Katrina and either looking for folks or being able to ascertain the amount of damage and homes that were destroyed. So we talked about apportionment. Here's a map and what it's showing you based on the 2020 census results is that there was changes in the seats in a number of the states. What we're seeing here based on the 2020 census is many states had changes in their number of seats. One state gained two or more, five states gained a seat, and seven states lost a seat. So you can see how important the 2020 census is in the House of Representatives representing each of the states. And as you can see at the bottom, we have the April 1st, 2020 population at 331 million four hundred forty nine thousand two hundred and eighty two so just ran i added a few knowledge checks within the presentation i don't expect that you'll be able to respond to these but i wanted to throw them out there as food for thought to hope that you're getting the pertinent information that i'm sharing with you in this particular knowledge check how many types of censuses does the Census Bureau conduct? I'll give you a second to think about it. So the answer is three. It's the decennial economic and government censuses as we discussed previously. Moving on to the economic census in action, we can mention here that study, this is a study of the industry and trends over time. It evaluates investment opportunities, implements public policy, measures economic development, offers information for business plans and grants. The economic census collects data for nearly 400 million businesses. For many of these businesses, I will say that they fall into a number of industries. Not all industries will be covered by the Census Bureau. One in particular would be like agriculture. That's not handled by the Census Bureau. So just to give you an example of how this impacted me, I took a course many years ago at the local community college and I had to put together a business plan. I used a number of our programs and censuses to complete my business plan because we had a lot of the data available here through our agency. Because the type of information that I needed was, you know, the median household income for the place that I wanted to put my business. 
how many other businesses were similar to my type of business? So that's kind of some of the things that you would need for your business plan, and all that was made available through the Census Bureau. Now, when we talk about the economic census, in order to locate the data that you desire in our tools, you're gonna need to know what sector it falls into. And the sectors are determined by the North American Industry Classification Code. They usually range from two to six digits. And you'll see in this particular display that the higher level, which is the accommodation and food services, the sector is 72. As we delve deeper and want more detail into the types of businesses that fall within the accommodation and food services, you'll see that the digits branch out from two to six digits to give you more refined information on that particular subject. Another knowledge check for you, what program takes the pulse of America's economy every five years? I'll give you a second to think about that. And the answer to this particular one is the economic census. Uh, as I indicated to you, I feel like, uh, or refer to it as the pulse of America's economy. Often when I talk about it with people when I'm doing presentations. The next thing we'll move to is the census of government. As mentioned in the diagram previously or in the table, this is collected every five years and years ending in two and seven. Government organization data and information are from the October of the year preceding the census. How governments are organized, how many people they employ and payroll amounts and the finances of the governments. This is the type of information that is made available through this particular census. And it is a required census that we are by law that we have to do. So the Census of Governments in Action, uh, the Bureau of Economic Analysis and the Federal Reserve Board use the data to measure the nation's economic and financial performance. State and local governments use the data to develop programs, budgets, and assess final financial conditions and perform comparative analysis. Analysts, economists, market specialists, and researchers need these data to measure the changing characteristics of the government sector of the economy and to conduct public policy research. So we're gonna move on and talk a little bit about the surveys. The Census Bureau does about 130 surveys across the nation. There's one in particular a lot of folks might hear more about though, that's the American Community Survey. It replaced the long form from the census that was done, I think in 2000 was the last time we used the long form. Because most organizations get their funding from the decennial census, we needed to find something that we could do in the in-between years that it would allow them to get the funding that they need because that funding didn't see them through 10 years. So this is what we came up with, the American Community Survey. And it also gives that detailed information on population and housing characteristics. It's done for the 50 states, District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. And it says here it occurs annually but it's actually sent out every month with information being um, totaled for the year. So you may get this since it is a survey. Again, a survey doesn't mean everyone is getting this. We've gotten many calls in the call center that says, hey, I got this, but no one knows what I'm talking about. No one else has gotten this. Is this legitimate? It absolutely is. And it, may not have gotten to your neighbors, but at some point it will. And whether they complete it or not, it's very important that they do because this helps to do the funding in those in-between years. 
So again, the significance and influence of the distribution of 675 billion in federal funds, and it's used for community planning program development. The 130 surveys that I mentioned are demographic surveys, economic surveys, and sponsored surveys from other government agencies. So the demographic surveys, I wanted to give you a couple examples of what some of those would be. Uh, we have the current population survey, the survey of income and program participation, the American housing survey, and the American community survey. A lot of these are done in the in-between census years and some are done every year. Um, the Census Bureau's population estimate program produces estimates of the population for the United States, states, metro and micropolitan statistical areas, counties, cities, towns, as well as Puerto Rico and its municipios, if I say that correctly, I apologize if I did not. The Survey of Income and Program Participation is a premier source of information for income program participation. It collects data and measures changes for many of our topics, such as economic well-being, family dynamics, education, assets, health insurance, childcare, and food security. The American Housing Survey data Excuse me, the Census Bureau's housing data present a comprehensive picture of housing in America. You will find a wide range of data on the size, age, and type of American homes, home value, rent, and mortgage, the housing and construction industry. So that's a little bit about these particular surveys. We'll move on to the American Community Survey. This goes out to about 3.5 million addresses per year, approximately 290,000 a month, produces estimates for the characteristics of both population and housing, and creates estimates for small geographic areas. As I mentioned, this goes out every month. It also is covering in detail statistics such as education, employment, internet access, population characteristics, and transportation. So moving on to our next knowledge check, which of the following produces estimates for population and housing characteristics each year? The key, I think, here is estimates. Remember, surveys tend to fall for within estimates. So I'll give you a moment to think about this one. And the answer to this particular question is the American Community Survey. Other information for you are estimates from administrative records. We do an annual population estimates. We also do monthly import export figures, weekly, monthly, and annual surveys of the nation's economic activity. Um, the Census Bureau also produces estimates of the population as well as projections of the population. We provide information on the quantity of imports and exports by country mode of shipping and the port they come into. We also conduct various other surveys that provide information on the economic activity and for various economic indicators. Now I mentioned a, a while back that when we conduct our surveys, we're doing a number of surveys for other government organizations. Here are a couple of the organizations that we work very closely with. Um, Department of Justice, we do uh, surveys for them for a survey on sexual violence, national prisoner statistics, annual survey of jails, uh, National Center for Health Statistics, or excuse me, Education Statistics, 
Census of Juveniles and Residential Placement, National Teacher and Principal Survey, Teacher Follow-Up Survey, and for the National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics, National Survey of College Graduate Survey. So that's just a, a few of the surveys we do for a few of the organizations. If you'd like to see what some of the others are, you will find this on our um, survey and program tab, and you can take a look to see what other organizations we might be working with. So an important element you need to be aware of is the census geography. It's the foundation of all data collection and publication. It has legal and administrative geography as well as statistical geography. The display of this geographic hierarchy used by the Census Bureau. The diagram reflects nesting relationships or how the geographies are related. Not all geographies are available in all the products that the Census Bureau produces. They will vary by census and survey. For instance, the economic census is mostly done at national and state level with some limited county and economic place information depending on the sector that you're working with. The retail trade sector has some data available at zip code level, and that's the only one in econ that has that level of geography available. So it is very important to remember that geography will vary according to census and survey. Moving on to geographic product, the TIGER, otherwise known as Topologically Integrated Geographic Encoding and Referencing System, is a geographic mapping database. TIGER has become the backbone of most of our GIS systems in the country. We produce maps, both boundary and thematic. We also do shape files as well as relationship files. All this information can be found under the tab where geography is listed as a topic. Now I mentioned before that you would need to go to the tab for explore data to get to the tools. Here is a displaying the export data and you'll see under the list at the bottom of the first column, data tools and apps. That is what you would need to select to get to some of the data tools that are available through the Census Bureau. Here's an example of one of our tools. It's the Tiger Web. And in the Tiger Web, <clears throat> this application allows users to select features and view their attributes to search for features by name or geocode and to identify features by selecting them from a map. So this is one tool that you could use to look at geography breakouts. Another tool that you can use is the 2020 Census Demographic Data Map Viewer. This is a fun way to take a look at data. Data visualization has become a real plus for so many of us who are very visual, we have made data fun, interesting, and visual. Check out our interactive map. Users can select the data and results to display in a thematic map, thematic interactive map. Data comparisons can be done by clicking on the box that displays when you point your cursor at a certain location. You can also do comparisons on this map as well. For those of you that may have been with us in years past, we had the American Fact Finder that was the tool that everyone would go to to get population and housing related data. We have sunset the American Fact Finder and have moved on to the data.census.gov. 
this tool not only replaced the fact finder, but in doing so has made data easier to access in the format that a customer desires to see it. You can get microdata, you can get a table, you can just look at a figure, you can draw a map. So this is a very versatile tool and one that I find very interesting to use versus the effect finder when I used to teach people how to use that one. Okay. The data products that we make available, this is by no means all the list. This is just some of the things that we make available. We have summary files available. We have analysis, microdata, maps and geographic products, metadata, visualizations. We have data profiles. We routinely provide these types of data products depending on the survey or the um, program that you might be working with. Some may be a little more limited than others. You'll have to check when you get into the tools to see the availability. Data tables are summarized by geography. Some analysis of the data, especially social and economic characteristics are available, microdata. This is the unaggregated responses for census or survey questionnaires. Users can then develop their own tabulation, cross tabulation using various software programs such as the public use microdata sample file, otherwise known as POMS. And like I said, you can draw maps within the tool based on the geography and data selection. Now I mentioned in the beginning that we have partnered up with uh, organizations. We do partnership and outreach. These are some of the organizations that we've partnered with. We work with the Federal Depository Library Program, the state data centers, census information centers, and the advisory committees. We work through our partnerships and outreach to understand what data users need and how to go about creating what they need in a product or service that we make available. So a lot of these organizations are the voice of you, the public, letting us know what kinds of products we need to make, what information needs to be made available, and we work closely. This is a very lucrative uh, program that helps tremendously in ensuring that we're making available the type of data that our data users can use. Um, who are our data users? Well, we have Congress, state and local governments, researchers and academic institutions, financial institutions, regional planning agencies, businesses and chambers of commerce, and you. Um, I want to share an example with you uh, that I found under our website. We have user stories that we put up when we are made aware of them. In this particular case, the New Orleans Fire Department uh, was used our data to create a statistical model using our American Community Survey, the American Housing Survey, and the 2010 Census to determine what homes might not have smoke detectors. And they went door to door offering free smoke detectors and installation to these homes that they found through the model that were like built before 1950 or so. They um, went out and surveyed and found that they, most of those homes did not have the working smoke sector, so a work, work, worthwhile endeavor for sure. Census Bureau Resources and Services. We have data training and workshops. We have statistics in schools. We have demographic consulting, and we have the Census Bureau Library. Our library has U.S. Census information going back to 1790, 
It's the largest collection of census publications around the world. We have statistics in schools that allows us the opportunity to work with teachers in creating lessons that they can use in the classroom to talk about the census. We also have demographic consulting. We also offer data training and workshops. A location on our site, and as Alexandra mentioned in the beginning, the Census Academy is a learning hub for data skills. So a lot of what we do uh, for training is located on this site. Whatever webinars that we do, uh, we offer data gems that are little videos anywhere from three to 10 minutes talking about a process of walking you through step-by-step step on how to access a certain type of data or use a certain tool. It also offers information <clears throat> through courses that you can take a couple of courses to learn uh, more about the data and how to access it step-by-step. And like I said, the webinars that we do, such as this one, and the ones we'll do as part of this series, if you ever want to go back and look at them, you're able to do that because they will be uploaded to the Census Academy. So the takeaways that I want to make sure that um, I mentioned to you is the key takeaways or the highlights that I want to emphasize from this presentation is the fact that we do three censuses. A lot of people are aware of the decennial census, but don't know that we do the economic and the government censuses as well. We do 130 surveys, and not all of them are just the Census Bureau surveys. We do them for other agencies because we are uh, very good at what we do and collecting and disseminating data. We have tools, we have data products, services, and resources to help you understand and access our data, and we cater our products and tools to meet the evolving needs of our partners and data users. So this is my information. Um, you can reach out to me or to the central uh, email that's listed here for census.askdata at census.gov or reach out to that phone number as well and we will assist you with whatever inquiry you might have. Um, that is the end of our presentation. If uh, Alexandra or Lacey, do we have any questions that we might want to address? Yeah, we sure do, Ken. Thank you so much for um, this presentation. This is a, this is a wonderful overview. Um, for those of you who have sent questions um, through the Q&A, um, we've answered some of them. If some of them are more specific, we will follow up with you in the next couple of days and make sure we get you an answer. Um, but Kim, we, we've had several um, specific questions about either programs or the data tools that you're touching on here. And I know that this is just an overview, um, kind of the first shot for the entire webinar series. Um, but luckily, every single question that was asked or every program or tool that was mentioned is actually included in the webinar series you've planned for the year. So would you mind just going back and kind of giving an overview of, of how you expect this to lay out um, and then mention to where's the best place for people to um, get information about the series and all the different webinars coming up and, and how they can register as well? I think that'll answer the vast majority of the questions we had. All righty. So, um... The Census Academy, as I mentioned, I'll go back to show you that slide. The Census Academy has a list of all the upcoming webinars that are a part of this series and ones that have already been done. Uh, a lot of the webinars that will be covered in the series are going to be related to much of what I've mentioned in this particular presentation. We have a couple of webinars that are going to address geography and mapping. We'll have several that are addressing the economic census that will also touch on uh, grant writing as well as business plans 
and also just a general look of the economic census. We have uh, a couple that are going to touch on the American Community Survey and delve into some of the topics that are available through the survey. Uh, we have a veterans data webinar plan that would be data that we could get from the American Community Survey. We have race and ethnicity as an ancestry and farm board webinars planned that will come from the American Community Survey. So that was the purpose behind me at least bringing up that particular program or survey uh, to ensure that you had the intro level announcing that that is available or is a program and that we are going to delve more into a detailed topical uh, webinar based on specific data needs. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're also going to take a look at the top three used data tools. Um, I showed you Tiger Web that that's available, but the census. Uh, excuse me, data.census.gov. We will have a presentation just on that tool. We'll have another presentation that talks about that tool and a couple of the other more prominent tools that are used. And you will find that throughout all the webinars that each of them will not only talk about the economic census or the American Community Survey, they are going to touch upon the tools that you would use to access all of this data. Does that cover, I think, the questions we may be getting, Lacey? That was great. Yes, thank you. You covered it a lot better than I ever would be able to. Um, Kim, would you mind putting the contact, the contact slide back up? Um, so there were several other questions about what is the best place to follow up. Um, like I said, we will make sure that we get to any questions we weren't able to answer during this webinar. We'll follow up with you in the next couple of days. But if you have questions later or something else occurs to you and you want to reach out to us, if it's specifically about this presentation, there's Kim Brown's contact information. And if you just have a general question um, about census data or our products or our programs, um, Ask Data is a great place and a great resource. Um, with that, Kim, I will turn it back over to you. I think that covers all of the, the general questions. And uh, thank you so much for your time and for your presentation. Thank you, Lacey. One more thing I want to mention at the bottom here is the information for the Academy. I want to emphasize that because you can get on a subscriber list. And being on that subscriber list, you'll get the announcements of what is coming up, uh, what we are planning, um, so that you would be able to get access to the links and information that would direct you to a specific webinar or course as it's released. So I would encourage our data users to actually sign up as a subscriber for the Academy site. So as we announce uh, our releases and new items that we would be putting up on the Academy, they would be notified of that information. Right now, we have all the uh, webinars listed on the Academy that are coming up in the series. As Alexandra mentioned to you, there's going to be about three to four a month from now through uh, September. So we're really looking forward to interacting with you guys and offering the information to help you better understand our data and how to use it. Um, I believe that's all I've got, so I will pass it back to Anthony. Thank you, Kim. That was great information. Uh, in closing, the next webinar data, on data.census.gov will be held on Thursday, February 10th at 2 p.m. We shared links in chat. You can see the uh, series um, page with uh, about 25 webinars are on there. Uh, before we conclude, I'd like to say thank you to those who participated in today's webinar. Please take a moment to fill out the evaluation by following the link provided in the chat. And thank you, Greg, for uh, monitoring chat. I appreciate it. Look out for the recording and PowerPoint of this presentation on Census Academy by visiting census.gov slash academy. Thank you all. That concludes today's webinar. <laughs>